In this video, I'm gonna talk about herpes simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus is, well, actually, it's two viruses. It's HSV1 and HSV2. And these are also known as human herpes viruses one and two. Because remember, we have eight human herpes viruses. Um, so the human herpes virus group includes a whole bunch of them. We originally talked about these back in host defense host response in your Katie Diaz case, because remember, Katie Diaz has mono, which is caused by EBV, and EBV is a human herpes virus. We also talked about cytomegalovirus there, which is also a human herpes virus. So in this case, we're actually going to talk about herpes simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus was actually the first human herpes virus that was recognized. It na it's named herpes from the Greek word meaning to creep. Um, cold sores, as they're sometimes called, um, are caused by HSV1 and HSV2. Um, so if you want to review kind of a lot about herpes viruses, go back to Katie Diaz. There's a lot of information in the notes there. And I'll kind of give a quick recap of just the alpha herpes viruses. Remember, there's alpha, beta, and gamma herpes viruses. And HSV1 and 2 are alpha viruses along with varicella zoster virus, the organism that causes chicken pox. All right, so the herpes viruses are a large envelope double-stranded DNA virus group with an icosa delta hedral capsid. Um, so just a slightly different shape there. Um, transcription of the viral genome and viral protein synthesis proceeds in kind of this coordinated and regulated manner with three phases. So I'm going to say this, and you're all going to remember it from Katie Diaz, right? That you've got those immediate early proteins, those early proteins, and those late proteins. And sometimes those proteins are used diagnostically to be able to determine kind of how long a patient has had an infection. Um, so if you want kind of a redux of how um, herpes virus replicates and the different proteins. Um, go back to Katie Diaz. You've got a lot of information in your notes there. So, okay, the viral encoded DNA has, or the viral encodes a DNA polymerase. And this is really important. This DNA polymerase is how the virus replicates its genome. And not surprisingly, it is the target of all of our antiviral drugs for the human herpes viruses. And this is important because HSV actually can be treated. We have some really good drugs for this one. The most common of which is acyclovir, um, but there are some other ones that we use from time to time. Okay. So when we think about the human herpes viruses, remember, we're also thinking about latency. All of these viruses, as far as we know, can go latent at some point in the body. And for the alpha herpes viruses, their latency site is in the CNS. It's in the neurons, okay? Um, so initially, you get infected at your mucoepithelial cells with HSV1 and HSV2. For varicella zoster, you get infected in two places, T cells and mucoepithelial cells. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, I don't know if any of you had chicken pox, if you guys were all in that lucky group that got vaccinated. I got chicken pox. It was unpleasant um, and itchy. Um, I was about five. And it's all over your skin, right? You get this nice fabulous rash. And if you've ever seen or experienced a cold sore, um, you know where it is. It's kind of, it's normally found like on the lips. Um, sometimes people experience them like in their nose or in their mouth, but these mucoepithelial cells are the site. And you get them by kissing. It's a kissing disease. A kiss is but a moment, but herpes is forever. And it's forever because it hangs out in your neurons. Um, and often patients who have had herpes for a period of time, um, when they feel a cold sore coming on, they say they can feel it coming on because it tingles. Um, and I think that's a really good way of remembering that that tingling might be associated with kind of the um, sensory function of the neurons there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the human herpes viruses one and two. HSV one and two share a lot of the same characteristics. Um, they have a lot of DNA homology, um, and therefore they have a lot of the same antigens, and they also have a lot of the same tissue trophisms and disease signs. So we can kind of talk about them in bulk, even though there are some differences. Um, 
they're able to infect most human cells, but they certainly do have their sites they like to hang out in. The virus generally causes kind of a lytic infection in fibroblasts and epithelial cells, um, and then latent infection in neurons. So you can kind of see here, they've got a really nice image that basically you get this active site of um, viral replication in the epithelium there, right on the lip where you'd expect to see a cold sore, where it's causing this lytic infection. And then what happens is it can travel from this site up along a peripheral sensory nerve to the site of viral latency, which is the trigeminal ganglia. Then later when it reactivates because of stress or too much sunlight, which is actually a thing, um, or uh, immuno, um, poor immune status or something like that, it travels back down that peripheral sensory nerve and you see kind of an outbreak there. And that's how I kind of associate it with the, the tingling that you expect. Um, so it can spread a couple of ways. Um, it can actually spread between cells through these kind of intracellular bridges, um, these syncytia. So we might see those, and that actually helps it avoid detection by antibodies. Um, and then it also can um, cause various inclusions. So these Cowdery type A inclusions, which I'm showing here. Um, the HSV virus also encodes a thymidine kinase scavenging enzyme, and that actually facilitates its replication in non-dividing cells. So remember, it's hanging out in neurons. Neurons don't divide all that often. They're kind of slow growing. So it uses this thymidine kinase to be able to facilitate its replication in cells that might not be so easy to infect. Um, Cell-mediated immunity is kind of required for resolution, and there's actually a really limited role for antibody in um, HSV. Okay, HSV can infect kind of anywhere in the body, right? I said it can infect most cells. Um, they're really common pathogens, and they can cause pretty painful manifestations, but most of them are benign. Um, it is often a recurrent disease, but not incredibly dangerous most of the time, unless we're talking about this guy, meningitis. Um, which certainly can be life-threatening, as is evidenced by the fact that I'm showing you a brain that is obviously not in someone's body right now. Um, so it does have significant morbidity and mortality if we see infection of the brain or the eye. Um, herpetic keratitis is also um, significantly dangerous. Um, and if you have disseminated infection, obviously, that is a problem. So I kind of have this image here, which just kind of shows all the places it can show up. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but you can see them there and um, look for more information if you're curious about a particular site. Um, so herpes encephalitis, let's start there. There's some really key things we need to know about that. First off, herpes encephalitis is the most common form of sporadic encephalitis in the U.S. Um, and it happens in healthy individuals. This is not something where we're looking specifically at an immunocompromised population. This is a healthy individual who sporadically gets encephalitis. Um, usually it is the cause of HSV1 more often than two, um, and it is not normally a cause of neonatal encephalitis. This is a rapidly moving and often fatal infection if it is not identified quickly. Like other encephalitides, it presents with a sudden onset of headache, fever, and behavioral abnormalities and focal seizures. The behavioral abnormalities is actually pretty key here. Um, now, I know I say that uh, with all of the encephalitides, um, but it's also particularly true here. Um, and let's talk about why. The hallmark of this disease is the involvement of the temporal lobes. Um, and the interior frontal lobes. You're going to see hemorrhage in the temporal lobes. I'm just gonna say that one more time. Hemorrhage in the temporal lobes. That's key. That's where you expect to see it with HSV. Um, diagnosis is done by first ruling out um, basically septic meningitis by CSF. And then you're going to look at the cell type, the protein, the glucose. So once you know you're dealing with aseptic, 
not septic, aseptic. And then you do an EEG, a CT scan, MRI, brain biopsy, whatever else can be done in that order. But first you make sure it's not bacterial meningitis. Once you know it's aseptic encephalitis, you have to kind of look at um, patient history. HSV should certainly be considered. You can do PCR um, of the CSF. Also, another key finding you might find here, red blood cells in the CSF. If you see red blood cells in the CSF of a healthy patient with a history of maybe cold sores who um, is experiencing behavioral changes, that's something you're wanting, going to want to keep in mind. The other thing that we note with um, herpes encephalitis is that these patients, I mentioned the behavioral abnormalities, they also tend to have like hallucinations. Um, and we think that that is partially because of where the hemorrhage is taking place. So most common cause of HSV encephalitis, uh, of sporadic encephalitis, caused by HSV1, you see a lot of behavioral abnormalities, hallucinations, things like that, red blood cells in the CSF, and you're going to see hemorrhage in the temporal lobes. Okay, everybody got that? Think of it again. If you don't got it, go back 30 seconds, listen again. All right, oral herpes. That's the other one that everybody always kind of, talk, kind of talks about. Um, this can be seen by either HSV1 or HSV2. Um, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but you get lesions that form on the labialis or the gen, um, gingivostomatis. Ah, why can't I talk this morning? On <laughs> the gingivostomatitis. Um, they begin as these clear vesicles that rapidly ulcerate. The vesicles might be widely distributed through the mouth. I mean, we most often associate them with just kind of like one, uh, you know, lesion on the lips, but they can be in the mouth. Okay, uh, herpetic keratitis isn't on here. It's almost always limited to one eye and it can cause recurrent disease, which leads to permanent scarring, corneal damage and blindness. So keep that in mind. That's one you wanna keep, in, uh, keep uh, track of. All right, we're gonna handle these two together. These are kind of weird manifestations of herpes. You've got herpetic whitlow, which is down here, and herpetic gladiatorum. Herpetic whitlow is basically just herpes on your finger, and gladiatorum is anywhere else on the body that is not the lips or the brain, so on the skin, right? Um, the virus establishes its infection through cuts or abrasions on the skin. So with herpetic whitlow, we actually associate that more with clinicians who have attended patients with HSV. Gladiatorum, on the other hand, is adequately named because it tends to be associated with uh, wrestlers. Um, and rugby players. So, you know, people who might um, be uh, more likely to have abrasions on their skin to be exposed to. Um, it's sometimes called mat rash um, in the wrestling world. Okay, so how are we going to diagnose it? Um, first off, it's herpes. So it has characteristic uh, cytopathologic effects. So we have those syncytia and we have those cowdery type, A's bot type A bodies. You can um, recognize them with a thank smear, which is basically just a scraping of the lesion. Um, so this is what's actually being done with a pap smear, um, where we, uh, it's very similar to that, um, or a biopsy specimen. Um, CPEs might include things like the syncytia, ballooning cytoplasm, the cowtree type A intranuclear inclusion lesions. Any of these are possible. A definitive diagnosis can be made by PCR, but viral isolation is still kind of your gold standard. And it's great because this uh, cell, this virus grows really well in HeLa cells. So we can grow them out easily and be able to um, see it. Treatment. Um, HSV encodes several target um, enzymes for antiviral drugs. Most of the anti-herpy drugs are nucleoside analogs. I'll let um, your pharmacology uh, professors uh, talk to you more about the mechanism of action of these and how they work. But basically, the nucleoside analogs are activated by that viral thymidine kinase that I talked about. So remember that thymidine kinase is really important for the virus so that it can establish infection in cells that don't replicate well, like neurons. Um, so when that thymidine kinase is active, it activates the nucleoside analogs, and then the analogs basically block um, viral DNA polymerase. Um, so 
many of the drugs actually work really well at prohibiting proliferation of the virus, but they're not going to do anything for latent infections. So once you have it, you have it, but it'll kind of stop your outbreak. Um, the most commonly mentioned treatment is acyclovir, but there are some other ones, um, pencyclovir, valacyclovir, vamcyclovir, and trifluridine. Um, those have also been approved by the FDA for HSV infections. So we do have some other options there.